Welcome to lesson 49 in Hydraulics 102 and lesson 7 in the section on hydraulic circuits. In this lesson, we will learn about hydraulic accumulators. First of all, let's talk about the word accumulate. What does it mean? It comes from the Latin verb accumulo, which means to pile up or to heap up, meaning putting or storing amounts of something somewhere. Imagine Scrooge McDuck, he is accumulating his wealth, or you can think of water towers as large water accumulators. Now that we know what accumulate means, we have to learn what are hydraulic accumulators and what do they accumulate. Well, hydraulic accumulators are components or devices in the hydraulic circuit or system which have the task of storing hydraulic energy, that is, a quantity of fluid volume under pressure. So they hold the work fluid. What is the difference between them and hydraulic reservoirs? Well, they store pressurized hydraulic oil, which can be directly used up by an energy consumer on the end of the hydraulic system chain. We can think of them as reservoirs of energy. Here we can see a couple of hydraulic accumulators on the pictures. And before we get into detail how they work, let's cover some basic types. Let's just cover the three basic types of hydraulic accumulators. The basic division is on the type of the counter force that is found in the accumulator. Now, we're going to see what that means in a second. Accumulators function automatically and basically they work on the principle of counteracting forces. Now, when the pressure in the system from the fluid is large enough that the force from the fluid pressure is larger than the force from the active element in the accumulator, then our hydraulic accumulators start to pile up the work fluid inside of them. So the force is larger, it overpowers the force from the active element, the accumulator will fill up with pressurized fluid. When the pressure in the system, the hydraulic oil pressure falls below a certain point and the force from the active element is larger than the force from the fluid pressure, then this force from this active element pushes out the fluid. Pretty intuitive and simple. This basic classification of hydraulic accumulators is done by the type of the active element inside the accumulator or more precisely the way how the force is exerted. So we have hydraulic accumulators with a weight which use a weight that pushes on the fluid. We have spring-loaded accumulators, which use the force of a compressed spring. And we have the most used hydraulic accumulators today, which are gas charge accumulators, which uses compressed gas to exert the force. So we use the pressure from the compressed gas. So the first type of accumulators uses, of course, gravity. The second one uses the force of a compressed spring. We're going to see how we calculate that in a second lesson. And the third type uses pressure from the compressed gas. Let's first cover the basic parts of a compressed gas hydraulic accumulator. On number one, we have the supply line. This is the line through which the hydraulic oil comes into the accumulator. So this is the only point on an accumulator that is connected to the hydraulic circuit. We can see from hydraulic schematics that this is the case for all accumulators, no matter what the type. They only have one connection to the system. On number two, we have a poppet valve with a spring. On number three, we have the steel housing of the accumulator, sometimes also called the shell. On number four, we have the rubber bladder in which the compressed gas is stored. And on number five, we have the gas supply valve through which we charge the rubber bladder, which is filled with gas. 
which is nitrogen most of the time. One little thing before we start to look at how they work, let's define pressures and volumes. Now, this is, of course, a gas charged accumulator, and we have three stages on this diagram. First off, we have the gas precharge pressure on number one. This is P0 and V0. So, gas precharge pressure is basically the pressure that is given to the nitrogen gas in the rubber bladder before we put the accumulator in operation. And the volume that corresponds to this pressure is the effective gas volume. In other words, it is the entire shell volume because in this stage, the rubber bladder fills the shell completely. Here we have the maximum working pressure and the maximum working pressure actually corresponds to the minimal gas volume at that pressure because at that pressure the nitrogen gas or any other gas that is in our bladder is compressed so we have p2 is large and volume 2 is small here we have the minimum working pressure and the gas volume at the minimum working pressure now, this is an example of a compressed gas accumulator with a rubber bladder filled with nitrogen. First, let's look at the picture A. The entirety of the volume or case or shell or however you want to call the steel housing of the accumulator is filled with the gas. As you can see, the bladder has filled the interior of the shell fully. Now, at this point, the volume of the gas is equal to the volume of the interior of the shell. So we can write the volume of the gas at this point is equal to the volume of the shell. OK, we mark the volume of the shell as V0, as we said in the previous slide. And the pressure of the nitrogen at this point has a certain value that we mark as P0. We said that this is the so-called pre-charge pressure. Now this pre-charge pressure actually has to be in the range from 70% to 90% of the minimum working pressure. In other words, it has to be smaller than the P1 that we looked at in the previous slide because if it's larger, then this rubber bladder and the pressure of the gas won't let the fluid in on the minimum working pressure. The precharge pressure is smaller and the hydraulic oil has to fill the accumulator up. And when the nitrogen gas in the rubber bladder expands, the bladder presses on the poppet valve, closing it so the bladder can't fill these crevices on the port. So this is the pre-charge stage of the accumulator. Now, because we started up our hydraulic system, the pressure is rising to the working pressure of the system. The pressure from the hydraulic oil pushes the poppet valve, opens it, it starts to fill the shell of the hydraulic accumulator. Compressing the nitrogen gas inside of the rubber bladder in the process, and this stage or process is called the charging phase. The volume of the gas is decreasing because of the compression and the pressure is of course rising to the pressure inside the hydraulic system. We said we marked that pressure P2, the maximum working pressure of the hydraulic system. When the pressure of the nitrogen gas equalizes, so when we have P2 here and P2 here, so the pressure of the nitrogen gas equalizes with the pressure of the hydraulic oil, the system goes into a sleep mode. In other words, nothing happens. So at that point, the accumulator is kind of in equilibrium. Now in the C stage, in the moment in which the pressure in the hydraulic system falls under the value that was reached in the nitrogen gas bladder, then the accumulator actually goes into play. In that moment, the nitrogen gas starts to expand, pushing the hydraulic oil out of the accumulator. Now, the process of bladder expansion lasts until the pressure of the gas and oil are counterbalanced and the pressure comes 
to the pressure P1. Now this stage is called the discharge of the accumulator. A small amount of fluid should always remain inside the accumulator at pressure 1 in order to prevent the bladder from rubbing or chafing against the fluid port poppet which will cause bladder damage. Of course, these bladders are made from rubber and they have a limited work hour, so they are often changed and serviced and we have to make sure that there is fluid here in order to prevent bladder damage. Therefore, the pressure P0 should always be slightly lower than the minimum working pressure P1, just because we have to make sure that this pressure P1 overpowers pressure P0 and doesn't let the bladder chafe on the fluid port and on the poppet valve. Because every component in the circuit has its task, accumulators have tasks in plural. Because they store energy inside of them, they can provide us with a couple of different services. They can be used as a reservoir with backup pressurized fluid. For example, when we need to supply large quantities of pressurized work fluid to the system in a short period of time. This is especially important on closed loop circuits. Number two, they can be used as a secondary energy source. Then the hydraulic accumulators can enable that the work cycle is finished without the pump's work, kind of like a safety device. Number three, they can be used as a shock damper. When we have valves in our system, for example, and we turn them on or off quickly, in those situations there is going to be hydraulic shocks, which accumulators can dampen. They are also dampers for the pulsations of pressure. Remember when we talked about pumps, we talked about pulsations. Accumulators can bring the amplitudes for the pulsations down a bit, okay? So they can make pulsations of pressure smaller. They can equalize the volume of the work fluid when we have temperature differences. This is mostly, again, in closed loop hydraulic circuits. And the last but not least, as a compensator for the fluid that is lost in drain lines. So they can compensate the fluid that's lost through the drainage lines. When we need to keep the pressure at a constant and we return some fluid to the reservoir through the drain line, the accumulators keep the pressurized fluid so we can compensate for, let's say, the lost fluid that goes to the drainage line. If you know a little bit about electronics, you've probably learned about capacitors. These little battery-like components that are used to store electric energy in an electric field. We can kind of compare these two components, pulling a parallel between the similar tasks that these two components do. They are both reservoirs of energy, which can be rapidly used up by an energy consumer, and they both function as dampeners or filters for the flow of electrons in the case of capacitors and the flow of hydraulic oil when it comes to hydraulic accumulators. The symbol for hydraulic accumulators and hydraulic schematics can be seen right here. In the resource part of this lesson, I left a great article which compares some components from the electrical world with the components that are used in hydraulic systems. If you have some basic knowledge about electronics, I strongly suggest you check the article out. Now, if you're like me and you're curious about stuff, you probably wondered, well, why nitrogen? Why are the accumulators filled with nitrogen? Why don't we fill this bladder with oxygen, for example, or just regular air? Well, molecular nitrogen is a colorless, odorless, tasteless, and inert gas at normal temperatures and pressures. What does that mean? That means it's a non-reactive gas. The strong triple bond between the two atoms in molecular nitrogen makes this compound difficult to break apart and thus nearly inert. 
because of this, we use nitrogen. Imagine having air and oxygen under pressure with high pressure oil. That doesn't sound good, does it? Remember, the diesel cycle in diesel engines uses this principle to get combustion, and we don't want combustion inside of a hydraulic accumulator if the bladder, for example, breaks and we have high pressure oil, high pressure air. And also when we put air under pressure, we get heat. And of course, we don't want heat. And this is why we use nitrogen gas, because it's a non-reactive gas. And this is it for the first lesson on hydraulic accumulators. Join me in the next lesson in which we will talk about accumulator sizing and we will talk more about various types of accumulators. Thank you for listening and for staying focused.